to fly and this time we have something which will be very interesting because we never had it before it's air race e electric racing racing with electric aircraft and jeff going to tell us a little bit more about this all right thank you Eli. thanks very much <laughs> Sorry. thanks um okay well thank you everybody for for coming out i'm really 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 grateful for your uh, attention on this exciting new project um, so, as Willie said, my name is Jeff Zalman. Uh, I'm the founder of AirRAC. So, we started the company recently. And uh, AirRAC E, in a nutshell, is the first electric, all electric airplane race. So, this is manned aircraft, 100% electric, racing around a circuit. Now, oops. Uh, to tell you more about Air Race E, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing now in current air racing. Uh, because actually, Air Race E is going to evolve from the very same format of race. So, right now, we're doing what's called the Air Race One World Cup. So, that's a form of Formula One air racing. So, many of you have heard of what they do out in Reno, Nevada. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. But before I tell you, I find it a little bit easier to show you. Volume. Just a quick video. You can see we start all eight airplanes at the same time. video is eight airplanes lined up on the runway all together at the same time in a grid pattern just like you'd see in an automotive motorsport lined up together engines running brakes on drop the green flag they take off they all roll off together they climb to about 10 15 meters in altitude just 10 or 15 meters all eight planes race around an oval circuit reaching speeds of 400 450 kilometers per hour passing each other around six pylons First one across the finish line is the winner. Pure racing, real motorsport, super exciting. And the reason this is relevant is because we're using the same format for electric racing. So it's gonna be based on the same principles and the same sort of visual. And just to help you with that, we race around, like I said, an oval circuit. So it's actually six pylons. And everything is visible in front of the crowd. It almost always takes place at an airport, uh, which is kind of our arena. And the, the teams are all in front. We actually often have 16 or 24, even 30 airplanes at an event. And it's, it's eight per race, different heat races, uh, and then into semifinals and final races. The Air Race One World Cup, uh, the Formula One sport, has already established itself in a really big way with a big media footprint. So we have, like, for instance, over one and a quarter billion cumulative audience, so our reach from our printed media, some of our bigger events, is our, has, a, has a potential reach of that many people. Uh, we're on TV, all of our events are on TV in over 100 countries, so we're all over the world in broadcast media. Uh, we have millions of engagements on social media, so we're really getting a, a big track record now with, with the promotion for Air Race One. And again, the reason that's relevant is because we're going to leverage this for the electric, so it becomes a great communication platform for electric racing uh, for the Air Race e. So why? We've had this great successful air race, uh, Formula One air racing and air race one. Why are we going to do something different? Well, I think we all know that there's a, there's a revolution coming. Uh, we all know that electric aviation is, is, is becoming very, it's the hot topic, obviously. It's going to become the future. It's really inevitable. Uh, and obviously you guys are here in attendance because you're curious about electric racing and electric aviation. Um, so that's a big, big part of what we do. And of course, manufacturers and different stakeholders in the industry are all 
piling resources into it. They're all taking serious attention, paying serious, serious attention to, to this particular uh, activity. Now, I, in fact, I just, I think it was last week, I saw on the BBC uh, a statement, and I have to go back and check it, but what it said was aviation, in 30, 30 years from now, aviation is going to be the most polluting industry in the world. Now think about that. We, in, the, in our aviation industry, are going to be responsible for being the biggest polluters in 30 years. That's huge now, and, and dramatic and, and not, a good, not a good thing. So uh, the pressure's mounting on all of us to, uh, you know, to progress electric aviation. And you know that, we know that. But air racing is the perfect way to do that. How? By offering, what we're trying to do is create a unifying platform. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an ecosystem, it's a platform, it's an opportunity for all the stakeholders, all the different manufacturers, all the different, the pilots, the teams, the engineers, the fans, the, the powertrain manufacturers, the aer aerodynamics professionals, to come together, everyone, it's an open platform, to come and, and share knowledge, compete against each other, collaborate, and all, all of the above. Um, so what we're doing is we're becoming a test bed um, and I like to say we're a real world, <coughs> excuse me, a real world mission for electric training. So as we know, it's going to be some time, perhaps decades, before we can actually have a, uh, an airline carrying a large number of passengers a meaningful distance. Um, but we can do this right now. This is a mission we can actually accomplish today uh, with, in, air, in air racing. So we're giving manufacturers a way to test it in the real world environment, not just you know, let's go fly and collect the data and figure out how this might work for the 30 years. We're actually giving them something. Did we win? No. Let's go back and, and get it right. Let's go fix it. Did we win? No, almost. So we're getting better. We're making improvements. So it's an iterative process in which we can expedite. So we're really accelerating technology. So where Air Race 1 is very much about spectators, fans, and the participants, a lot of fun. Air Race E is very much towards the industry, the stakeholders, the participants, and developing the technology and communicating that out to the rest of the world. So, so why us? Like, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about this? Um, because of the work we've done with Air Race One, we're actually uh, the only organization in the world that organizes international air races with multiple planes racing against each other. So you're all familiar with probably the Reno Air Races uh, out in Nevada. Um, they do, we actually race there too, so we race in, in Reno, um, and, but that's a US national championship. So we're the international version of that. And obviously you're very familiar with the Red Bull Air Race, which does a fantastic event. We all know that and love it. It's a really cool event. Uh, but it's a different format. It's a single plane, more of an aerobatic time trial, if you will. Um, whereas we race eight airplanes together, so it's just a different different type of racing, but we're the only ones doing this. So that gives us a very unique opportunity to have some of these things. I hope I'm not keep walking in front of the screen. Some of these things that we have in place for the current racing that we do will all be already in place for air race E. So sanctioning bodies, governing bodies, sports associations, uh, the pilots, the training, the rules, the race rules, uh, the format, uh, the cities, the media, all the things that we, the machinery we have behind it, um, and of course the test pilots and the airframes itself, so the airplanes, we're just switching out the powertrain. So we're already poised, what we don't have, of course, is the technical partners, many of you. Uh, it's a very important part, obviously, it's the whole point of it, but that's what we're trying to, to uh, attract now is the different technical partners that want to have a, a presence here. We've done that with the first one. The first one is Airbus. Uh, we're extremely proud to have Airbus on board. Uh, this is a, a huge, uh, we, we feel it's a huge validation of our mission and our purpose and, and what we expect to achieve. And they've come on and also, uh, you know, uh, are helping us nurture this and, and grow this. And they see the same value and the same, uh, same motivation, the same, I guess, objective as we do. And what's really exciting is, um, in fact, they just confirmed in an interview I did with them a couple days ago that they see a direct link to what we're doing now in Ares E and the products they're going to be delivering and selling 30 years from now. 
they can trace that back to, to what we're doing today. So that is really exciting. It's just it's the same kind of model as in most other motorsports, in automotive, motorcycles, boats, uh, often using air racing like this. So we're thrilled that Airbus sees that. So now we're turning to others. We're opening it up. Uh, so really the kind of, kind of purpose of this, uh, what I hope to achieve over, the, over the, the very near future, is to get more partners involved. So really what we're trying to do is to say, okay, look, like I said before, it's, everyone's welcome. It's an open platform. We're not doing a single spec plane and that's the plane and everyone races the same plane. In our view, that doesn't do much for competition. So there's a competition, of course, in the race, but also a competition in technology. So we want other people who see that and want to prove they're the best. It doesn't have to be a powertrain. It could be air, you know, the, the airframe. It could be all the, all the different parts of a plane you could name, and the service providers and the systems. Uh, so we're, we're, we're inviting everyone to come together. What we're helping to do is to facilitate those teams to come together. So we, we've already actually had about, uh, I think it's about 60, almost 60 expressions of interest for teams that want to participate in this. And some of them are half teams and fragments of teams, and we're gonna start merging them together. Um, and we've just actually, just I think it's today, issued a newsletter announcing that the rules are available, and I'll mention those in a moment. So we expect a lot more interest to come, come along. And uh, we're really, really delighted that most of the industry is really paying a lot of attention to this. So what are the rules? What are they building? What's the, what are they working towards? This is just a quick snapshot. Uh, we actually have, um, well, I'll start with talking about Formula One racing again. We're, the reason I keep mentioning Formula One is because we're actually using the Formula One rules. So in Formula One rules, there's, uh, there's the rules to run the race, and there's also the technical rules. It's the only airplane in the world that's actually built to the specifications of the formula. So it's not a specific model of airplane. They're all built from designs on a napkin or plans. They're, they're totally built from scratch. Uh, they're not production models. Um, so all those technical rules we're applying forward to Ares E, except of course where it concerns the powertrain. Um, so some of those things, and I'm talking about the first point here, some of those things are uh, the aircraft has to be 66 square foot of wing area. So that's fixed, that's in the rules. The wing can be any shape, it can be two wings, but it's got to be 66 square foot of area. Uh, 500 pound minimum weight, fixed landing gear, and so on. There's a number of dots you have to connect. So that's, that's what we're, we're adapting for electric. But of course, the electric power is gonna be a different function. So we have uh, 150 kilowatts is the power that we're setting in the rules. So those of you making motors that are less or more can even adapt those. You can put two or three together. You can uh, have the convert, uh, controller uh, limit the power. So we're trying to pick a number that actually suits, the, and this is actually important for everything we do. We need that our rules and our what we're testing and what manufacturers are going to be building for this series has a market applicability, that the products are applicable, or at least the, the technology is relevant to the technology they're developing. So that's how, how we set these things. Race is going to be five laps, about five minutes, full power, full power all the way from takeoff. As soon as brakes are off, they're already full power. They race five, six, five, about six, five, six minutes, um, and then they have a reserve to, to land. So on the battery charge, we're not actually setting a limit, like you're gonna have 20 or 25 kilowatt hours of charge. We're actually saying that's up to you. So you can actually determine what's best for the, you know, the, the profile of the, your powertrain. What we don't want is people calculating it too fine, and of course not making it back to a safe landing. So we're working on provisions, of course, for that. Uh, what the, the default program right now is that we have an, a backup battery that is automatically triggered if your power runs too low. And if that happens before you cross the finish line, you're automatically disqualified and have to leave the circuit. So um, you've got everything to lose, uh, not even discounting the safety, you'd be disqualified if you run low on power. So there's a lot of really interesting engineering and technical uh, questions that we're, that we're tackling right now. It's really exciting. Last thing I'll say on that is that we're welcoming feedback from the partners and the participants because we want to get it right and make sure it's not only super, super, super safe, but contributing to the technology we want to develop. Now to help us do that, I'd like to introduce a colleague of ours who's actually heading up a project at the University of Nottingham. I'll let him explain it, but Richard Glassick, if you want to come up. Um, 
is uh, the University of Nottingham is a partner. Richard's the, the lead of this. Where we're actually developing the first prototype racer. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Yes, so uh, as Jeff mentioned, I work at the University of Nottingham as a research fellow uh, in electric and hybrid electric propulsion for aircraft. Uh, and sometime last year, the university decided to have a, a research program uh, dedicated to putting a electric demonstrated aircraft in here using some of the technology that we develop. So the University of Nottingham's got a very extensive record in uh, developing electric power and machine controls um, for a variety of industries. And lately in the last five years, that's been developed more and more for aircraft. So we have a lot of uh, clean skies programs and other research uh, efforts, particularly uh, funded from Europe and UK research organizations in all kinds of aircraft electrification. So when the opportunity came up and uh, I, I saw that Jeff was establishing the RAC program, um, and I looked at what the RAC format was, it was an obvious fit that we, we could uh, use RAC as part of our own uh, research and development program, thereby helping Jeff and all of the uh, goals and uh, uh, things that he wants to achieve for electric propulsion generally in the, in the industry, um, but also helping us uh, get our own research effort towards it. So uh, late last year, uh, Jeff kindly lent us his own airplane, the CASA 3 there, the green one you can see. Um, that's him delivering it uh, last year. and. We're in the process of modifying it. It's going to be a retrofit. So what we want to achieve in the first phase of the, of the, uh, of the program is to retrofit it as an electric aircraft and have roughly the same performance that it was delivered with. Um, so in fact, it's got a roughly 80 kilowatt engine that we've pulled out of it. So we're going to put a roughly 80 kilowatt power and propulsion system back into it. The reason why this actually works, and one of the background aspects to uh, Nottingham is that we run an electric racing motorcycle program. And that, that's been very, very successful over the last five years. Um, and the size and the power and the weight that's required for that motorcycle is actually very similar to what's required for the aircraft. So we've got a background in component and uh, system technology development that suits the electric race program. So at the moment, we've got various types of electric motor to uh, um, install uh, and test. And we're in the process at the moment of doing that. We've got several uh, off-the-shelf types of propulsion system, and then we've got the University of Nottingham developed systems. Um, and I don't know which button to press here. The green one. The green one. Oh, not that was the red that one. That backwards. <laughs> Top button. Yeah. All right, so you can see there that we've just pulled the original engine out. Um, we're at that stage at the moment where we're putting together the new system components to put back into the aircraft. And it will basically be the same um, power that came out of the aircraft and the same weight that came out uh, as the aircraft was delivered to us. That means that the test pilot, when he comes to fly it, well, should have the easiest job in the world. Uh, he's used to flying his airplanes and it should handle and perform exactly how he expects it to. Um, and I'll just go back to this one. And, I mean, in fact, the, the slide shows this um, upside down, but uh, you can see the original cassette mount frame. Uh, sits at the front of the aircraft. The battery packs will go where the original fuel tank was, and there's also some extra room in the cowling now because it's just having the engine and the cylinders uh, there. Um, and that's about all I really want to say right now. I'm happy to take questions and discuss all of the fine details with anyone who's interested afterwards. But uh, in the meantime, that's um, that's where we're at. Yeah, I think we have about five minutes, if I believe. So if anyone has any questions for either of us, the technical ones, I'm going to pass over that way. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, let me know. We've explained it all Actually, I, I fielded a question earlier today uh, that was interesting. And um, RAC has set at 150 kilowatts as the maximum power level. Um, and so there was a question as to, is current technology adequate to provide 150 kilowatts for five minutes with an electric propulsion system that fits in this type of airplane? And actually, it's a good question, because uh, when you run the numbers at the moment using current technology batteries um, and electric motors and drives, it's, it's going to be quite difficult to get 150 kilowatts into an aircraft that weighs what these airplanes weigh at the moment. In fact, that's a really good thing, because over the next couple of years, we want the, everyone to come in um, you know, from industry and from research and try to develop a system that can do it. 
was going to say, now you tell me. <laughs> but yeah, no, exactly. And I think that's the thing, is if we pick something that was too easy, there would be no incentive and motivation. Uh, we, we picked this number again, 150, because that seems to be some consensus, is nothing's unanimous, but uh, that there's an application in the market for that. So let's help, help drive people towards that. Uh, that target, and this is the uh, one way to do it. So I think there's different ways to achieve, uh, and there's definitely going to be challenges, and the weight of the battery, and all the things that we're aware of, but I think we're in a good position to get it there. Uh, just quickly, I just realized I didn't mention when our first race is going to be. Uh, we're actually going to have our first race at the end of 2020, so about a year and a half from now, is the first ever electric air race. Um, so that's going to take place then, and that gives us about a year, a little more than a year and a half, it's developed, so it's not a lot of time to solve even that problem, let alone all the other issues, of course, we're going to face with, uh, with getting the teams together and all the, all the locations and the safety uh, uh, precautions in place and the rules. So it's going to be a big challenge, and that's why we're looking for a collaboration from everyone else. It's actually one of the other reasons why uh, our demonstrator project is going to be really important, even though we're not trying to optimize this aircraft, we're not trying to develop to a full power, 150 kilowatts, we're happy if it flies safely and reliably at 80 kilowatts, but it sets out the, um, an example for any other competitors in the world who want to look to see what's uh, achievable, what kind of systems are going to work, and how to install them. Uh, and so our phase two project over the next two to four years in Nottingham will be to develop a custom bespoke uh, propulsion system. So we, we do our own power electronics and um, motor design and manufacture and testing. Uh, so we will be developing a 150 kilowatt power unit for AirAC. And as Jeff mentioned, this 150 kilowatts is a very nice um, power level for a lot of other industrial applications, commercial applications. Um, not so much for large commercial transports, but there's a lot of missions which you can look at, uh, some of which are represented here um, at Friedrich Haber, which use and can use a 150 kilowatt uh, propulsion unit, uh, whether it's a single unit or maybe several. Um, that starts to open up various commercial and industrial um, missions. Okay. Yeah, I think so. I will. Sorry. Oh. Okay. I was going to say, I didn't know if we were getting cut off or we have some questions. Please. Uh, and then the, the one over there, Chris Tell. Uh, Jeff, um, uh, just intrigued. Are you in the short term sticking with the propeller that's on that picture? Because um, it strikes me that given the torque characteristics of an electric motor, you, you could start messing around with rotation speeds and variable pitches and things like that. Sure, let me say two things, and I think Richard's going to give, probably give more appropriate answers speaking to you, but it won't specifically be that propeller. That's a cruise prop that we had on that plane, so there are different propellers, there are race propellers. No, that's a good observation. Uh, the other thing is that, if I could just address something in, 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 intrinsically in the way you asked the question, uh, which is a good, good question, by the way, I don't, I don't mean like that, but you asked, uh, are we going to be sticking to uh, one thing I want to be clear of is actually we're leaving it to the teams. So my quick answer will be, I don't know. It's, it's correct, exactly. So as much of this is open to development as possible. We've got, again, we've got rules that we're sticking to. Those will start to one by one open up as well for development. So what propeller, and it's the same in Formula One as well, what propeller you use, uh, there's very few constraints on it, so it's really down to you to tell us which propeller it is. And I didn't know if you wanted something to add. But, um. Well, uh, no, it's a good question. And I think in the rules at the moment, it's specified that the propeller will be on a single axis, uh, central axis, so you don't want to have uh, lots and lots of you know, different layouts. Um, the propeller is going to be either at the front or the back of the airplane. Sometimes they run canards and things like that. Um, but it should be on a central axis. It can be counter-rotating. So um, in the rules, as they're written at the moment, uh, it makes a provision for counter-rotating propellers, which is going to be interesting. Um, not sure about uh, variable pitch or whether it's even necessary. It's probably not necessary. Um, and in, in the detail, um, we, will, we will be able to run this propeller on our system. Whether it's the best propeller is, is, is probably not. It's definitely not going to be the best one. But we will be developing a system in order to run it because we want to experiment with all of the um, parameters we can and the existing equipment that the airplane came with. Okay, last question. Okay. Just quickly, what kind of specific training uh, or qualification would an uh, air race E pilot need okay. to compete? Well, obviously, an excellent question because 
in all of this, I mean, we all know this in aviation anyways, is safety is always first. So it's not just the equipment, it's the, it's the operators clearly have to be trained. So we're going to, again, going back to the Formula One air racing model, which we use in Air Race One, and we use in Reno Air Races, et cetera, is, uh, is, a, is the, and those rules, by the way, uh, that the International Formula One Air Racing Association and the Formula Air Racing Association in the UK uh, have developed and been evolving for over 70 years. Formula One Air Racing is over 72, 73 years old, and that governing body has been establishing those rules for a long, long time. So, much of those rules are related to, of course, training and competency and evaluation of the pilots, and not just once to get your race license, there's an actual race license, but on an ongoing basis. So we're going to be defaulting to the, the basics for the Formula One use for the racing. So for the preparation of the racing, there's a lot of tailwheel hours, a lot of other things, a lot of you know, some aerobatic competency. Um, but then there's a, a different question which we can't quite answer yet, which is what sort of competency level does the pilot uh, and ground crew have to have for the electric management side of it? And, and that we're establishing. So, and we'll hopefully work with people like you to help us learn more about that. Partners like Airbus and other partners that we're talking to, which hopefully we'll be able to announce very soon, um, are, are also wanting, wanting to uh, contribute to, to that question. So safety overall, super important, pilot and machine, and everything else that goes with that. So. Thank you, Jeff. And okay. for those of you who want to know more, um, you will have more presentation. We have the eConnect area there in the back. They have a booth in A7. So if you have more questions, just contact Jeff there. Yeah, He's going to be around. And now our next uh, presenter is uh, you, somebody who perhaps at some point could organize the propelling of such an aircraft.